Now, I want to go today into the subject of the male-female symbolism in Tantric Yoga. You will find uh, that in the Tantric art forms, that every Buddha or aspect of the Buddha has a feminine counterpart. <coughs> and that not only do they have feminine counterparts, but they also have various levels on which they're represented. In other words, we started out, you remember, I described in the last seminar, there were the idea of five so-called Yani Buddhas. And these five, who represent, as it were, the center of a rose, uh, one's in the middle and four surround. Then each one has a corresponding bodhisattva form. And then each bodhisattva uh, has in turn a corresponding heruka form, but they're all forms of the original five. Then uh, whether they're in the form of a jnani buddha, or in the form of a bodhisattva, or in the form of a heruka, which is kind of wrathful and weird, far out to kind of uh, character often with bull's heads. There's one here, um, uh, which we can look at as a little statue that uh, Kim has brought over. Uh, they're all reducible to the original group. And all have these female counterparts, and they're represented as in sexual intercourse, uh, touching at all points, uh, in, in a complete embrace. And the idea is that this embrace lasts forever and ever and ever and ever and never ends. Because this is a way of representing the nature of life. What is fundamentally involved in this system is self-knowledge. You see, if without resonance nothing happens, if there are no echoes, you can't hear anything. Supposing we get a room in which we blanket all the walls, and blanket the floor, soundproof it in every possible direction, you can hardly hear anyone talk. Because voice requires resonance. That's why people enjoy singing in the bathtub. They suddenly discover they've got a good voice. Because suddenly the bath uh, and the structure of the room, which is all non-soundproofed, resonates their voice. That's why you use a uh, a violin or a cello or a bass fiddle has a big a wooden structure to make the sound resonant, to play back to itself. And that's why we are all so fascinated with recording things, taking photographs, writing them down, and above all, remembering. It's a form of resonance. Because you see, if you don't remember anything, you don't know you're there. A person who had total amnesia and lived in a split second only wouldn't know he was there. We could conceive, and perhaps there are some forms of life that don't know they're there. Uh, I don't know whether my in, uh, particular cells constituting my body, I don't know whether they know they're there. Maybe they do. Maybe they have some wonderful system of resonance that I know nothing about and they're all worried about what I'm going to do with them. And having conferences and meetings and uh, uh, policy decisions and so on and so forth because this, this person in charge... Uh, you know, it, it might well be that when I die or when we all die, all our cells suddenly say, God is dead. And they have their big <laughs> theological controversy. <laughs> and uh, uh, say, well... We just have to fend for ourselves from now on. And that's called corruption. But they all go off on their own. <coughs> so, uh, I don't know. It may be uh, that, that we've got some kind of a system like that. But uh, certainly, to know that you're there, you need an echo. 
So I invented this limerick. There was a young man who said, though, it seems that I know that I know. What I would like to see is the eye that knows me when I know that I know that I know. <laughs> so this is the, the thing, you see. Not only do you remember what happened and uh, say it made an impression on me, which means it made me remember. Like your retina remembers uh, whatever is seen so that it sticks there a little. In other words, that's why you get the illusion of a circle of fire when you revolve a cigarette in the dark. Uh, it makes the impression of a circle because your retina remembers and holds, as it were, the impression of the flame. And uh, so then, beyond that, we are, we are absolutely fascinated with the whole principle of remembering. And so then, uh, when there's some gathering of people and we say, uh, well, this is a great day. What a wonderful pic picnic or whatever it is we're having. It's a pity somebody didn't bring a camera. It should have been photographed. Now, do you see that in this whole thing, there is both a gain and a loss? The, what one school of people are saying, it should be photographed. The other school of people are saying, let go of it. When you go around, uh, we had so much experience of this in Japan because all our students brought cameras and uh, were constantly photographing things. And I had a camera and I was constantly photographing things, but I felt that as so long as I had a camera with me, I was somehow distracted from actuality. I had a little box with which I went around grabbing life. Of course, it's great to come back and look at it uh, in the form of photographs, but there's something about the photograph that is inferior to the actual uh, experience that you're photographing. But uh, there is an immense fascination in photography, in painting, in reproducing. And reproducing, you see, is the same thing as sexuality. It is reproduction. Only in another way. Because it tells you you're there. You're alive. The thing bounces. It echoes. So the, the duplicity in all this is, <clears throat> you see, one school of religious people say, let it all go. Don't be attached. In other words, and they also say, live in the moment. Like Krishnamurti's doctrine of uh, stop trying to remember everything. You may need a kind of uh, factual memory for your name and address and a telephone number and uh, things like that. But don't uh, linger over memories and treasure memories and say, well, I'm going to keep my girlfriend's lock of hair and I'll take it out every now and then and look at it and feel wonderful, you see. That's clinging to life because that memory has got you hooked. It holds you to the past and it holds you to death. But then there's the other school of thought, you see, quite opposite to this, which says, remember to remember, title of one of Henry Miller's books. Uh, hold on to it all. Get involved. Keep your girlfriend's hair. Keep all the photographs. Uh, you know how uh, in some houses the piano, everything is completely covered with photographs and reminiscences. I went to visit... Um, Gloria Swanson once. I've never seen such a house full of memories. Everything in all directions was Gloria Swanson. Photographed on this occasion, signed on that occasion, presentation this. Uh, I went to visit once to the wife of a former Archbishop of Canterbury. And the whole house was memorials. I mean, it was a complete clutter of tombstone furniture with little brass plates on it, presented on the occasion of this, that, and the other. Well, you say, look, that person isn't really living. And uh, they're all in the past. But on the other hand, what is life, you see, except there is a memory, except there is an echo? So what I want to point out, you see, is the duplicity of all this that you don't take, if you're a wise man, you don't take sides in this issue. You do both sides. 
And that is the meaning of the unity of samsara and nirvana. On the one hand, you let go of everything and you live in the eternal now. Because that's all there is. See, memory is an illusion. It's all gone. So everything you know about that makes an impression on you is no longer there. That's the meaning of maya. There is only the eternal now. There is only the present moment and never will be anything else. Because even what you're remembering is happening in the present. The memory is in the eternal now, isn't it? See? So it's all really absolutely here. But on the other hand, what fun to drag it out and to make it echo and to get involved and to fall in love and to become attached. Once R. H. Blythe wrote and said to me, I may have told some of you this story before, he wrote me a letter and said, what are you doing these days? As for me, I am abandoning all kinds of satori and enlightenment and I'm trying to become as deeply attached to as many people and as many things as possible. As these are the two sides, see? So, uh, the thing is this. It's just like riding a bicycle. It's a balance trick. You suddenly find yourself falling over one way, well you balance that, you turn into that direction and you stay up. And so in the same way, when you find yourself becoming too attached to life, you correct that with the realization that there is nothing except the eternal now. Then when you feel that's all right now, you see you're safe again, this is the only the eternal now, once more you go and get attached. Or you get involved, you get concerned about some enterprise, social, political, amorous, uh, familial, uh, scholarly, artistic, whatever it is, you get involved. And the two always go together. So this is the meaning of the symbolism. Because the male only knows he's there if there's a female. It's the echo. And she only knows she's there if there's a male. Nobody ever came into existence without a couple of parents, see? And uh, there's simply no other way into this universe. Now this is simply, I'm using this simply not as the main point, but as a sort of illustration of the simultaneity of attachment, detachment, involution and evolution. Involution is how you get involved, evolution is how you get out. Well now, this tantric yoga represents all this in the most extraordinary symbolism, which is basically the human body 